Hi. So today I'm going to talk about Pi to Store, which I uh, just released. You can pip install it uh, since two days ago, um, and, and a few ideas surrounding this. So I'm going to start with uh, the ideas. Um, here's here's my context for those people who uh, think about uh, prod code out there and performance and safety and all that. I, that's not what I'm focusing on right now. Uh, as the CTO of uh, of the startup, the two main problems I really had were adaptability uh, and and uh, getting to a POC quite quickly. So literally, I would be coding on one side of the room and the CEO on the other side of the room with a small divider would be talking to clients and I would sometimes hear him, I would say, promise things to clients and I would literally change the way I code as I was listening to this meeting. Uh, because I knew that that would add something and I you know, needed to already adapt for it. So it's quite stressful. Uh, and even more stressful than when that was, was all the, the boilerplate that was needed to, to get to the data to a point where you can model it. And then once you had a model, the boilerplate of actually deploying it and making it work for the client. Um, the biggest thing of all, though, so I just talked about a POC, get quickly rolling out something so the client can actually see uh, the work that you've done. But then something changes. Something always changes. The, you know, I'm going to focus on storage here, so you'll see the kind of things that change. You know, the type of data, the type format, where you need to host it, what DB, uh, all kinds of things. Right? And so uh, this is a bit of a story of the methods that I've uh, developed for myself to be able to quickly adapt to these situations which I thought first were just black magic, dangerous, don't do this at home. But actually, some parts of it, I think, are actually just good coding styles. And I have uh, had the OK now of uh, we sold you know, last year. And I've had OK from our company now to uh, spend half of my time on this for a year to package, let's say, these techniques and also make them open source. So the reason why I'm here is I need some smart people in the room, some specialists, some, some people that can see some value in this and can see how to make it better um, contribute to this. Uh, or you can just use it uh, or not. So uh, here's how it goes. <clears throat> First of all, I'm going to show you a few, uh, the bigger picture of this, right? And then I'll talk specifically about storage. So these are the kind of techniques that I've uh, been developing. I have something. I want to get something else. And uh, well, I need to make it, right? So let me give you two examples here. I have some code um, that does something, some functions, some classes, whatnot. Uh, everything works on my computer. But now we need a, a front end for it, don't we? And for a front end, we need a front end to talk to the server, right? So you need an API for it. You need a web service for it. All right, so what do you do? Um, well, how I did it first is I called the web service guy. I have no clue of web service. I, I come from math. I just you know, became a data scientist and a developer on the way. So I called the web service guy who was 10 hours uh, away uh, in Europe. And, uh, and I explained what the algorithm does. And then he re does it in PHP. And two weeks later, we have something. Terrible, terrible way of doing things. So I asked him to learn Python so that he could use my Python code add the web service layer, and then, then we can get it, right? Uh, and that now takes a few days. But even that's not fast enough. So I learned how to do web services in Python, and it's a few hours. But still, a lot of boilerplate, and a lot of mistakes in boilerplate. To me, boring things, uh, that's where I make the biggest mistakes. So uh, instead, one weekend, I try something crazy. I said, what if I can do this automatically? And the first way I did it was a bit crazy. But after uh, seeing what the security issues could be and all that, now we have something. And it's been running on prod for three years. And though most of the people said, that's just, you shouldn't do that. Why? Because no one else has done it. Maybe they're right. But three years have shown that they're not yet right. We'll see at the end. So uh, here's some, some quick actual pieces of code uh, to do this. Uh, this one, by the way, is, uh, is not what I was just talking about. 
but it's uh, a lot more satisfying even because it actually has a front end to it automatically generated. Take three functions or a hundred like I've done with sklearn stuff. I have this big list, that's one line, and then do this with it. Say, this is what I want to deploy. You import your stuff. Um, get get a uh, convention, so I call raw style right here. Uh, modify that convention possibly because you don't like exactly what it is. So here's an important point. Opinionated, but you can change as much of the opinion as you want. That's that's the way to make a framework uh, you know, more flexible, I guess. Uh, and then I just call this function, dispatch functions. Funks tells me what I'm trying to do. Raw style tells me how. And there you go. And it actually works, and I get something absolutely horrendous because the convention has a raw CSS, but you can imagine making that a lot better, right? Uh, define that whenever there's a list of things, you put it as a graph as a default, for example. So that's the kind of things I'm talking about. Here's an actual example uh, to make a web service, right? And more complicated here, because it involves a class. You need to construct the class. You say what? Uh, there's more stuff to do, right? Here's how you can do it. It's literally just that, no matter how many functions. So now it takes me two seconds to deploy something because I just copy the function that I want, the method I want to expose, and there it's done. Yes, it's done once I build up enough of a vocabulary. But here's the deal here. What if I have a complex object or data frame or my own object, right? JSON just works with strings and numbers and well not, so I have to I have to say, how do I represent this on the wire? And that's how I do it, right? I can do it name-based, type-based, a combination of both. I just construct a language to say that efficiently, again. And that's all it takes then. So the general principle of this is I get a source, right? Um, and I try to go to a target. And the way it works, let me say, let me take an example of a function. I have that function. What does it have? The functionality. What else does it have? It has a name. Maybe I can use that to make my route. It has a signature, maybe with types in it, definitely with names of arguments. Maybe I can use that in my URL or JSON definition. Uh, it has a doc, hey, maybe I can use that to describe it or uh, transform that doc to make a, a documentation. Uh, or maybe I can do even better, and this I haven't done yet, is I can just take all that stuff, make an open API specification, swagger that is, and then point that stuff to my functions. And now, not only do I get this web service for free, but I also get 40 language binders. Someone can call it in C, someone can call it in Python, all that for free through doing this, right? So again, I have my constructs. I wrap it around with some kind of meta interface that's data-based that I can manipulate, and then I have some things to translate from one to another. And it works wonders for me. So again, I'm not talking prod until someone that is used to prod touches this. But I'm saying if you want to do a POC, uh, do something fast and get things running, it's definitely a way. And if you want to enforce conventions in your developers, put the convention in this, and then they use this, and the convention is automatically enforced. Now, a little story about this. Uh, Raymond Hittinger, mentioned this uh, seven uh, plus or minus two. I had this slide done before he's done that. So, <laughs> so you know what it's about, and I don't have to say it, right? Uh, but I did insert a new slide because he did this before me. This is what it's about, new words to make computers easier to use. Uh, Remin Hittinger of this morning, I should have put the, the time right there. So I'm going to try to go quickly here through uh, naked code, right, the, the kind of thing. So you can see uh, originally two days ago, I made a notebook, I was to do live code, demo of some IoT thing where you can get some streams, store it, do stuff with it, and then, oh, suddenly you have to do things in the cloud, or suddenly you have to do that, and how you could do that easily. Uh, I changed my mind now, so now I'm just gonna go through a few snapshots, right? The code doesn't matter, this is the long way. You got a stream, you wanna store it. Uh, what you have to do, you store it in local files. You have to define like how that looks like, a root folder, 
and some kind of template for where to do things. You have to make the directories of the folders on the way to the path, right? Um, you have to also, when you read it, and you don't want to read the bytes, you put bytes down, but when you read it, you want to read it as a, as a waveform, right? So some NumPy array of things. Um, so you have to do that as well, right? Uh, by the way, from the stream, you get a session, a block, and a chunk. So basically, you think session and block is a good way to timestamp the chunks of bytes that you're receiving. And so that's what you have. You have a session block, and under that session block, you want to put this chunk of data. Um, here, show print sessions. Here, store stream. You can see all the work that I've done before. I put it all together, and now I get something that stores it. And here, I show that it works, but here's then I start doing a bunch of that all over the place, hundreds of lines of codes, thousands of lines of codes, always with the same pattern. And I'm happy it works. And it's very easy to read in a sense because everything is right there for you until this happens. The client now wants to say, oh, those recording sessions, I'd like to put some information about them in it. And the most logical place to do it if you're doing local files is, is actually uh, doing it under the sessions folder. But you didn't accommodate for that. So now your data structure, your key changes. You need to accommodate for it by putting maybe a data between sessions and blocks and then putting info, a folder where the guy can just you know, dump a bunch of files in it. Uh, that's good, but everywhere where you, you know, were opening files and all that with certain file path, you have to change that. You will make mistakes, you will forget a place, you will have bugs. But you finish it off, and then something else comes up. Oh, now we, we actually have several sensors in our, in our thing for the same, you know, so at the same time, maybe it's like stereo and a accelerometer and temperature. So now you have to accommodate for that. Same story. And then it continues. Suddenly you say, oh, we are doing things in the cloud. But wait, not always on the cloud. We need on-prem sometimes on the cloud sometimes, and sometimes on-prem and sync to the cloud. Great. Again, change all your code and insert that cloud aspect to it. And it continues again, you know, all kinds of databases and then, you know, some people come with different formats, they already have their data and it's their own file structure, they give you an FTP address, they give you SSH, uh, you know, Dropbox link, etc. Well, here's my solution to it. <clears throat> Build something like this, right? So, I mean, you've seen these kind of patterns again and again, uh, I would say, People will think of ORMS. I think this is more of a DAO, data access object. But essentially you say, look, I'm going to abstract uh, out some operations, operations I need uh, from the actual database or the storage system, and then uh, have some kind of way to, to translate uh, the stuff coming in. And there you go. And the question comes, okay. And then, so I started doing this. I said, okay, what operations should I choose? What operations? are the most used, the most fundamental, and you can find them pretty much in any database or storage system, cloud, local. Uh, my choice, uh, I think you would agree, is, uh, I won't show it yet, my choice is uh, key value, right? Files, key value. Yeah. Plenty of things, key value. <clears throat> so I'm gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on being able to say, store this value data in this key, Give me what's under that key, under that file. Just think files. Uh, delete that key and list them so I know what's there and then I can get them and filter them and that sort of stuff. So no, in, no heavy indexing and all that, not yet, right? Just the fundamentals. So then the question, when I was starting to build this, is I need to find one consistent language for it so then people can plug in their own language. They can call it what they want. They just have to override and say, I'm calling, I'm giving an alias. Again, reference to this morning. Um, so what do I call it? So I look through and I realize that there was a lot of different names. Let's just take write. Write, dump, sync. I actually started writing a scraper thinking that I could possibly get some kind of a count of the, what is the most used and then I realized it was a bit ludicrous to do that. Um, so I chose one, I think it was write and read and started writing my code and then I realized there's only one choice actually. And I'll argue with anyone here, there's only one choice that makes sense in Python. And it's none of the things that people have been using. Only one choice for what I'm trying to do. And that's 
wait a minute, the DICT interface, right? I mean, if, by the way, my, my biggest audience is the, you know, the data scientists here, you know, they, they write their code and it's all over the place, I would like to give them something that is simple that they can use, they don't have to take care of all the DB complexity, and I can reuse it as much as I want. I mean, after the first 10 minutes of Python, they'll know a dict. This is the right choice for me. So I can do all the operations I want, plus, you know, using an ABC, I can add some more. It contains length, et cetera. Or length, I added myself there. So that's my choice. And I go on with it. So it looks something like this. So let's say you want to write a persistor, I don't know, to SQL. You need to write the init. That's usually the hardest part. Like, how am I going to translate SQL to key value, there's many ways, so you need to find it there, you need to the URI, the passwords, everything to be able to access it. And now you have the object. And then you just have to say, well, how do you get item in a, under that key value perspective in SQL? How do you set an item, how do you delete an item? And usually you can see there's a list of, I think, 10 persistors so far. You can do this with, they're not all well tested, but uh, S3, local files, Dropbox link, Dropbox uh, app, API, SQL, Postgres, ArangoDB, though it's not tested quite yet, uh, DynamoDB, you, can, you have this. And they're all very simple, except for the init. So that, that's the DBs you can switch, the persistors you can switch. How do you deal with the rest? Uh, the keys and the values. Values, serialization, right? Value in and out mapping, and for keys. And this is really, really important. Uh, you can do a lot more than I originally thought with by just doing key and value mapping. Getting a really fundamental persistor and almost all the rest can be done with key value mapping. Even validation, you're not allowed to touch that. Uh, you know, you want to talk in, uh, in relative files instead of absolute files, you can do that. You want to translate something that's written like with pass into a dict for Mongo that says it's this key, you can do that. Everything can be done through here. So this is then what it looks like. All that horrible code we've seen before, a lot of it at least. You first define your store. Three things. A persistor. You're taking a local file persistor. And I can say plenty of things, but here the only thing I'm saying is this is my root folder. And I can write to anything underneath. That's my default here. Key map. Well, what does that relative path look like? And here, I don't know if you know this, but I'm not only saying the format of the path, and that's the only things really that you, I'm counting in the store, I'm adding a .wav to it, um, but I'm also doing something to the block, right? Because it comes to me in, in one format, and I wanna, yeah, I'm gonna put a bunch of zeros in front, right, for whatever reason, right? So I can do that all in that one line right there, and plenty of other things. So by the way, when I switched, like before, from session block to a session data block, that's all I need to do, change this part. Everything, all the code remains the same. Val map, remember, I'm getting bytes inside, but then I want to get it out as a NumPy arrays. Well, that's what I do right there, right? And the code behind that is a few lines only. And then there you go. I make my store and I get on with work. And this is what it looks like, you can try it out, try it talking to your file system this way. Uh, here, I already put stuff in it, and I'm looking at the three first ones, and uh, getting the first key, getting the value, and I don't even print the value, sorry about that. Um, here, I'm getting some microphone bytes out of my microphone, putting in four is my session, 20 is my uh, block, and it will actually do that path for me. I'm not sure this is the greatest. Oh yeah, so I'm showing, I'm putting in bytes by getting out to NumPy array. Anyway, and then I can play the sound, right? So, <clears throat> it's a matter of this. This is code uh, taken from the previous junks that I showed you. So it's a matter of doing something like that or just doing that. I'd like to just, just pay attention to this right here. Um, there is not, pretty much, there's not one character here that is not focused on the only concern that it's need right here. If you put a path in there, that slash right there would already be a concern. That's, that's not what you're doing. What are you doing here? You're taking this chunk and you're storing it in something that only depends on session and block. 
Slash already means that you're putting in a you know, file system or some string key, right? That's not going to be so in Mongo, perhaps. So exactly and only what you're doing is expressed right here. I got this chunk, and I'm putting it in something, a key. That I'm not saying what it is, but that key depends on session and block. How you get to the actual key, that doesn't matter. It does not matter. It shouldn't matter, because if it does matter, you can't adapt. Um, or another example, I think, on, on the read right there, right? So I do all that those operations, which I have to change later on, to, uh, to that. Give me the stuff that's in session block. How? I don't know. But, you know. In what format? In the format that I decided once and for all. And if I need to change that, I'll change that later. So, and then all the other things I said, you know, change the persister and all that, you know, I'm not even going to show you what it looks like when you have thousands of lines of code. It's between that and no lines of the logic code. You, you know, the, the, everywhere where you, your actual app works, you never touch it again. It's on for this, right? You just touch the thing that makes a store, that defines a store, and you do something like that. Right, so here I don't, oh, I just changed uh, some path. I didn't change much, but you can change, you can put it on S3, on Mongo, and change everything you want. And uh, I think that's all. I went to the time for question. Oh, no, that wasn't all. I wanted to say where this was going. Um, the crazy thing that I'm trying to do is really push this further. See how far I can push it. This, I'm pretty sure, is just a better way to do things. And I'm pretty sure you can put any safety and any even uh, efficiency, when the efficiency matters, into this. But it can go a lot further, obviously. You can see what, what other operations are ones that you really want to have. And how about a layer of indexing, which databases uh, offer you and are very useful. Where do you put that? How do you do that in a similar philosophy? And this is just storage. How do you do it for all the rest of the pipeline? Is, you know, is it even possible? Well, I don't know if it's possible, but that's what I'm going to spend half of my time this year doing, trying to explore this and see if I can get closer to what I actually would like to have, which is uh, a natural, not a natural, a more efficient way to talk to a computer. I still feel right now we're just giving lines by lines. I mean, yeah, since basic, where I started, that dates me quite a bit. Um, we've gone, gone a long way, but I still feel we can do much better than that. And so I like help to do that. And if you want to help out, there's a, you can try it out. And there's lots of things we can do, and even things are not listed there. Uh, if you have crazy ideas, please come to me. That's the kind of ideas I like. And thank you. Does anyone have questions? It looks like you created a new type, and then you're able to index into it by using the, the array notation. Yeah, and I've um, just created a, a, a type, but that subclass is, in this case, subclass is the, uh, the dict interface, right? Uh -huh. So it's a type that, if you're new to Python, you already know or will know very soon. So just imagine you're storing things in a dict and write your code that way, but just change what the dict, uh, how you make that dict. And, and it will talk to your file system, or it will talk to S3, or it will talk to whatever yeah. uh, you okay. accommodate for. Did you show the code that defines um, that class? Yeah, I showed. I, uh, I showed pretty much what it looks like. Like this. Uh, did I wait? Did I show you the code for the actual persister? No, this is the code. Sorry, this is the code okay. that does the mapping. Let me let me see if I. Um, can show you an example of it. Yes, I have some. I have some code right here. If I can extend motivation. No, nope, that's something else. Pi to store. By the way, that's all you have to do. Uh, Google finds me. 
So here's what, here's what a class for, this is one way to do it, right? I, this is a lighten, so I can put it right here, but this is for, for files, right? So that's exactly and only what it can look like. It already does a lot of stuff. I would just add some layers of safety and all that in that. But you see that all I'm doing right here is saying my mode, right? Uh, and the root directory, right? And so I save that all there and let's see how to set an item. I open that, okay, right there, and uh, open it with write in that mode and write that V in it, right? Now, this is the naked version, right? I'm assuming that V is, well, here text or binary, and my K has to be a full path, right? How do I get from that to, let's say, session block? I just add a key mapper that will make that full path for me, and now I can t talk a more natural language. But essentially, that's it. This right here will work with full paths. Um, In fact, I think the root directory don't even need that anymore here. All right, more questions? Let's thank our presenter. If you have questions, you can go outside and talk with him. Thank you. Thank you.